Now on four racing news and views without blinkers to Doncaster for the morning line. Good morning, welcome to Doncaster on the penultimate day of the 1994 turf season. In case you didn't know, it's uh, Guy Fawkes night, and that means it's Lester Piggott's birthday. Yes, he's 59 today. And it's exactly 25 years ago since racing's most celebrated grandfather last won the November handicap. And Tintagelus cruised up now with Lester Pickett into the lead, a furlong and a half to go. Tintagel has taken up the running and gone well clear of Jarbatina in second place. Then Spur on, lucky finish, Dutch Bells, Penfort, Lady Anna, but nothing's got any chance with Lester Pickett on Tintagel, who's come right away with 100 yards to go. It's Tintagel and long way clear. Lucky finish is running on to be second, followed by Spur on. But at the post, it's Tintagel the winner, then lucky finish, Spur on. Leicester absolutely bolting up on Tintagel, his partner today in the big race at 2.30 is Mr Confusion. He rides that one for Sally Hall. Mr Confusion having his second run at a mile and a half. He is one of 25 runners for the Tote Credit November Handicap, which as you can see from that best price uh, list available. Leicester's uh, mount is a 16 to 1 shot, but they go 8 to 1 the field as usual. Tintagel won easily, but in recent years this has been a very competitive handicap and it follows suit once again today. But we've got two experts who've been spending the evening, uh, not together, but thumbing their way through the form <laughs> books. Glad you said John that. and Leslie. My husband's much bigger than I. Uh, yeah. You looking forward to this? Oh, I mean, I just said to Andrew Franklin, who produces the programme this morning, I said, why do we always have to go for a 25-runner <laughs> handicap? You keep looking through, and there's horses that you fancy sort of 20 to 1, and then you, there's something else. Plus the fact the ground here was atrocious yesterday. I mean, you came up yesterday. You raced here yesterday afternoon, didn't you? Yes. Yeah. Um, sadly, with a horse that wanted better ground than we got, but there were jockeys getting off yesterday, saying if we get any overnight rain, it might be called off tomorrow. Well, obviously it hasn't been, but we have had a touch of overnight rain. Mm. Well, actually, Leslie, we, we started the show with Mr. Confusion and Lester Piggott. Let's start our review uh, with him. He last ran it in the Cambridgeshire, and that was over nine furlongs. Given that he's expected to improve over today's uh, distance, not a bad effort. William Tell also in the field. Well, he's got every chance, Mr. Confusion. He's, um, he's a horse who's um, appreciate this soft rain. In fact, it's the first time really that he's had conditions in his favour. And interestingly enough, he comes past William Tell there in the closing stages. And uh, Lester just niggling him along, hands and ears. You'd have thought that if uh, maybe he was battling for first place, then you know there was a little bit of extra in the tank. He's off the stud as well after today. He's got an excellent chance, I think. Mm. I mean, we uh, William Tell also running a good race there, just behind him, John, uh, just behind Mr. Confusion there. He tackles a mile and a half for the first time, and uh, yesterday Leslie was busy. She caught up with John Carroll and asked him if he thought he'd get the trip. Well, Michael believes he's ready now for the mile and a half, so I mean, he should. He probably. I mean, Michael think he definitely gets it. And what about this ground you've ridden this afternoon? What's the, it like? The ground is real heavy. It's very, very testing. I mean, it, for a horse who's first time over the trip, he could do with the ground being a little bit better, just to help him get the mile and a half. Uh, John, really sort of, Leslie, making the point that the trainer feels he'll improve at the trip. Uh, but there's encouragement on the pedigree side too. Yeah, there is. I mean, obviously, first time a mile and a half normally in these conditions, you'd be very worried. But the dam um, aim to please, which I must say, I think William Tull, therefore, very well named, whoever thought it up. Um, one over a mile and six, <laughs> and was actually aim to miss. I should think his son was pretty chuffed when he got the apple. But um, one over a mile and six, and was also second in this race under nine stone ten, not beaten very far. So, I mean, that was a hell of a performance. So if the dam certainly got home well and went on to get further, if the trainer thinks that, you know, I'd give him every chance. Got a, hard, got a hard task. I mean, I think he's... I mean, I, I thought when I watched him run at Newmarket, he was crying out for a mile and a half. He was always off the bridle. This was having won on soft ground at Newbury the time before. He was very impressive. And I must admit, I thought he'd win nicely when he went back to Newmarket the time after. And he was never it was going... It firm there, though, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, I think one thing was the, was the ground. And also, I mean, he, he looks as though he's, you know, just wanting this extra distance. But having said that, I mean, he's very testing here. I mean, a horse that's proven over the distance is, is Blushing Flame, who's been one of the market leaders since the weights came out. I mean... We saw on Channel 4 or sort of a month ago finishing third, and then he went and won at Ascot last time. How would you assess his chances? Well, that was a good run at Ascot last time. He, um, 
had one or two useful horses um, behind him, but he had a good run. He wasn't that far behind Wizard King at um, Ascot um, back in June. That wasn't a bad run, and then he didn't run after that. I think he must have jarred himself up a bit. So, you know, he's had that little bit of a break, and um, he's, I mean, he's obviously got good chances, and there's, there's two or three in here. It's a question how they're going to act on the going. But unproven on the ground, that was what I was going to say. What you would say about Blushing Flame is he's got quite a round action, so although he's not really proven well, he's got, on Actually, it. if you look at him head on, it looks like he's doing the breaststroke. Yes. He's got splayed <laughs> action, hasn't he? Yeah. Whether, whether horses like that ever want really extreme conditions, though, I, I mean, I think... They're probably someone somewhere in between neutral conditions. But the next horse we're going to take a look at has absolutely no worries on score of distance, ground, or form. Penny a day. There he is. Mary Reevely's, Mary Reevely's representative won in good style, taking the Ladbrook handicap here a fortnight ago. But it's Penny a day for Kevin Darley, the man in form. He comes down to the furlong pole with a three length lead. Over bit on the side in second place. Walsh and Whisper stays on for bases. But it's Penny a day for Kevin Darley, who's uh, really having a tremendous day here at Doncaster. But Penny a day takes it. Penny a day it is. Bit on the side. And it's a photo third between Proton and Walsh and Whisper. John, you and I were working that day, and now he was cantering the whole way. Um, the second horse there, bit on the side, has got an eight-pound pull, the third proton, a six-pound pull. What chance of reversing I don't think it'll make any difference at all. He's won with his ears pricked in the last 50 yards, and I should think if that uh, bit on the side, if she'd got to him, he'd have just gone on again. I was really impressed with that. Well, it's interesting you say if he got to him, he'd gone on, uh, gone on again, because uh, yesterday Leslie caught up with uh, Kevin Darley, the jockey, and said, uh, ask just how much Kevin thought he had in hand. Um, he won very well. Um, he's a horse that's obviously come to hand late in the year. Um, he won the time before, well, he was second at the time before Haydock got the race. Um, he's a horse that likes a bit of cut. I don't think the ground will inconvenience him any. And he's on the upgrade. It's just, he's gone up eight pounds in the handicap. It's just whether he's capable at this level to carry that sort of weight. What would you be worried about from the competition point of view? I think uh, the horse that Jimmy Quinn rides, Michael Stout's horse, would be the one to beat. But uh, at the same time, my horse is in good form. We're quite sort of hopeful with him. He's, uh, Jimmy Quinn, of course, rides Blushing Flame. We discussed him. But, I mean, he's every reason to be confident, Kevin, hasn't he? Yeah, absolutely. The, the other nice thing, um, no disrespect to some of the jockeys, but of the people I spoke to, he knows his horse. And there's quite a few jockeys riding horses in the race today for the first time. Mm -hmm. And in these conditions on a horse you maybe haven't ridden before, whatever the trainer tells you, I mean, the trainer's got to exude confidence. There's no point putting doubts in a jockey's mind as he gets on the horse. <laughs> but <laughs> it's got to be a bit of a... Well, there's no point legging them up and then saying, well, I'm not sure he'll get the trick. Did that ever happen to you, Franks? Yeah, but it's... Jumps beautifully <laughs> the favour of what yeah, yeah. Well, when they're out of the can behind you, that's what they do. They all, I never ever rode a horse that the trainer told me jumped badly. They're always really good. Yeah. yeah. Sorry, I just digressed there a little bit. Yeah. No, I think, I think and today in, in these conditions and in a big field and everything, just the advantage of knowing your horse, I think Kevin, as you said, every reason to, to be confident. Well, one we know really well, and I would say from that expert knowledge, inverted <laughs> commas, uh, the ground will not suit Baruch this afternoon, admirable horse though he is. I mean, he took the uh, British coal handicap here over the course and distance beating Saxon Maid, and it was a pretty good effort. But he just strikes me, John, as a horse who wants uh, a, a bit... A bit of a faster surface. I agree with you. He's a big horse. He's long striding. Um, he's a very good mover, but he's a classy horse. And it wouldn't surprise me at all. I know he shouldn't go on the ground. Wouldn't surprise me if he got through. It's going to be, you know. Well, let's just have a look at how good he can be on his day. <laughs> But it's still a surprise guest. Here comes drummer Hicks on the outside. From top seas, white tap face with tender. Barouge finds room, Chatham Island none at all. Wide is Saxon Maid, who's finishing best of all. They're inside the final furlong now, and it's Saxon Maid. And Barouge, who battled from drummer Hicks as they race up towards the line. Barouge is going to take it at the post. Barouge striding on. Barouge, Saxon Maid, the one, two. Actually, <laughs> I was just going to say, Alistair Dan's taking the mickey out of my statements. He's writing them down so he can use them against me later on. But uh, we'll, we'll press on. What, I mean, we've, we've mentioned half a dozen. There must be a whole host you can... There's loads. I tell you, I wouldn't rule out Googly. She's no. a, she had a little run round over hurdles. And uh, she will relish this ground. Mm. And the other horse that love it is White Chapel, who's a relatively fresh horse. What about the Northern Hope one on Monday, Cumbrian, uh, Cumbrian Rhapsody? Mrs Pallister. She can't go to the butchers if her horse gets beaten on a Saturday. <laughs> so, uh, you know, the, the, there'll be double joy if she has a, has a winner today. Yeah, yeah. I, I spoke to Joe Fanning yesterday, who mm. I think has got the ride on that. And um, he, he, again, unfortunately, he's somebody who hadn't sat on the horse, but uh, said he had every reason to think uh, 
he was in for a nice ride. There were an awful lot of them yesterday saying, oh, well, we'll be tracking round. You know, we want to be covered up. We'll be, we'll be, you know, we'll be going round. So theoretically, the last two furlongs, there ought to be a real scramble. I mean, the pair, you haven't actually eliminated many, have you? You sat on the fence over a few... It's, I mean, it's hard, isn't it, this time of year? I'm very yeah, keen on William Tell. If I, I, I shall go and have a look at them later. I'm going to back William Tell and Penny a day. Leslie? Uh, William Tell, I would agree with. Warm spell again. Yeah, that must have a good uh, I would say it's up to a, a very yeah. good chance. Yeah. And, and a, a sort of I'm a real sure. outsider would be Mark Tompkins' horse, the Flying Phantom, actually. I could see him yeah. loving the trip, um, not necessarily minding the ground, and, and Mark's horse is in good form at the moment. I'm surprised you went for warm spell. I mean, I know Why? Well, I know the horse is in good form. He had a couple of winners in the week, but I just don't think he's ever beaten anything. Oh, Always no. comes no, he's been running years, really yeah, well in competitive yeah, handicaps. Yeah, but what's he been beating? Well, he hasn't actually beaten much, but he, he runs to his mark in the ground. Well, yeah. He'd be fifth or sixth if he runs well, I think. We'll lose a bit on the side on that <laughs> one anyway. He's not going to tip you to win him, but he definitely <laughs> wants to be fifth or sixth. Alice, there's sure to be an awful lot of money changing hands on this. Uh, what are the early hints? Well, the early hints are that Labbrooks are taking a view about the top two, Blushing Flame and Penny a Day. They think the ground's wrong for Blushing Flame. They think the penalty is too much for Penny a Day. They've gone short on bit on the side, eight to one, where there's ten to one freely available. And they've had good money all through the week on Googly, the one Franks was mentioning that will really go on this ground. Hills have taken money for one horse only so far, but it's only bits and bobs. The 33's John's Act is being taken. Uh, mainly because Labricks are going 18. There's a huge discrepancy there. There's always a reason when Labricks go short. They're not exactly green or wet round the ears. And they are Labricks expecting an onslaught, in their own words, for Lock Song at 5 to 1 each way for the sprint over in Churchill Downs tonight. They think that sentiment will rule people's heads and they will reach their wallets and take that 5 to 1 each way Lock Song. That's the action at the moment. So, just a mention of Lock Song there. Let's digress for a second. Will it win? Will she win? I was very surprised that she had such a hard gallop two days before the race. Not being funny, sprinters don't normally need much work. I know she's a sort of, she either goes all out or she doesn't do very much, and maybe that was the reason. She's, she's, she's won the American Hearts now, win, lose or draw, because of the time she's clocked. But being cynical, I would have been slightly deterred by the I fact she's done so much. I didn't think you were cynical, actually. So it's a no, <laughs> is it, it's a no then, is it? Um, and also, <laughs> it, uh, well, I'll have to say, Hubby says on this one that However far she hits the gates over here, she'll be shown what she's doing over there with American horses around her, and she'll be hassled early on, and I just would worry about her temperament. Of course, so the, the I would worked in the States, too, not yeah, yeah, and he says they spend so much time over there teaching their sprinters to hit the gates. Although she is fast, I mean, you've got to give her that. That would be a big plus. He could just see things taking her on early and maybe are not liking it with the dirt coming back and so on. John, I'm sorry, also it's horribly negative. Tears or joy? Well, I mean, I, I understand what Leslie's saying, but sprinters, when they're working, basically, you can't make them go faster or slower. You sit against them and they do what they want to do. But would you have done it two days before? You can't do anything else. They, no, they're, they're either flat out, or they're, they're not, there's no halfway between you either go for a counter or you say, right, let them go and have a blowout, which is all she's doing, having a blowout. We went down to um, have a look at her before she ran in the July Cup or something, and she came up there like she was on fire. She does it every day, I think. I think if they clocked her at um, Kingsclear, she, uh, she thinks she did exactly the same speed. I mean, that's mm. just how she is. Well, Fast. that's uh, what's going to happen <laughs> later on. Let's press on with the news from Doncaster overnight. We haven't had quite so much rain as other places. The first race here, 12.55, non-runner in the 3.35, number 17, Failt Row. Four live for you on Channel 4. They're going soft after a tenth of an inch of rain overnight. At present, it's overcast and dry. I would say this morning it was... <coughs> this afternoon it might be... <laughs> it's going to be reasonably mild, though, 13 degrees Celsius. And it is a very important day here at Doncaster, apart from the uh, Manchester Handicap. It's... Uh, uh, a charity day, it's the Macmillan Nurse Appeal and there's all sorts of events going on including a barmaid's derby during the meeting, it's something it's the best race according to John Frankham of the afternoon and there's a big screen here for race goers, that's an innovation that's catching on more and more, I know it's expensive for the tracks but uh, it's well worth doing. Racing uh, split equally between north and south today, flat at the Doncaster, there's also good jumping cards at Sandown, Chepstow and Newcastle. Well, I didn't know we were doing sound effects for the weather forecasts, and I won't try and compete with Jim. Believe it I'll or not... i do the snow. <laughs> 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 believe it or not, it's supposed to be going to be dry with some sunshine today, so uh, believe that or not, at your peril. One thing that is very good is the temperatures are going to be above the seasonal norms. You can probably say it's going to be a typical autumnal day. 
Right, at Sandown they've had three quarters of an inch of rain since lunchtime yesterday. The going is now good to soft from good on the chase course, good in places, and it's soft and good to soft patches in the back straight on the herd. Of course, they've got a seven race car, they've got a cracking race here for the gunpowder chase, Juba Siller and Dockins Express. Express and admis admission charges, members £13, in the grandstand it's £9 and if you want to just go into the park itself it's very cheap, it's just £3, they get underway there at 12.45, there's a non-runner in the 150, number 7 Rich Life and as always look out for the roadworks on the M25 between junctions 8 and 7 and 10 and 11. Over at Chepstow, over the jumps, first race there is one o'clock and the going is soft. Although they've had a fifth of an inch of rain overnight, they're hoping for some sunshine this afternoon, decent temperature, but a few showers, so do take your umbrellas. And of course, the M4 Roadworks junctions 22 and 23 at Magor, that is west of the course. They've had a small amount of rain at Newcastle overnight. The going, though, is still good to firm. They get underway at 1.10. Norman Williamson has rise in five of the six races, including Morcelli in that Ekbalco hurdle. And uh, he's doing really well. He's third in the jockey's list, just ten behind Richard Dunwoody. bits of news to add what John and Leslie told you. If you were going to a team chase at Hatton in Warwickshire tomorrow, don't bother. It's been cancelled because the course is waterlogged. Um, if you fancy a firework display, there are ones uh, at Hill Park and at Kempton this evening. They'll certainly be well done. Kempton quite often do one uh, during the racing season as well, so I'm sure they are well adjusted to it by now. And an event for the week ahead, uh, the Princess Royal is supporting the Countryside Race Day at Cheltenham on Friday, uh, 11th of November. The day will help both the British Field Sports Society and the Riding for the Disabled Association, which is celebrating its Silver Jubilee year. Alistair, those are all the headlines I've got for the moment. What have you got for us? Well, the trades are majoring on the Breeders' Cup. And here on the front page of the life, the main chance British have golden opportunity to erase cup nightmares, referring to Britain's dreadful record in the event, two wins from 70-odd runners. And in the life uh, Breeders' Cup pullout, Euro Raiders up against it. Just warning punters all the way that times are hard when it comes to trying to win races in the States. The British have a bad record. And the Racing Post, very bullish, go locks on go, well she will go, but will she go quick enough, will she go early enough, will she go round the bend, well more of that later. And also in the Post, I'm not talking round the bend of course, David Nicholson's, <laughs> talking, David Nicholson's column, talking about Barton Bank, last week's casualty on Channel 4 at Weatherby, had the, that dreadful fall and that appalling mistake. David saying that you know, he was in a sorry state after the race, blood pumping out of his sinus. I have to say that the Hennessy Gold Cup looks unlikely at this stage, but I wouldn't rule it out entirely. But he's issuing a warning there to hold bets. And here on the home front, Spell could spoil Piggott's birthday party, is the implication. Warm Spell, the mudlark, Gred Wood going for that in the Independent. And here's birthday boy Lester we mentioned. He says, I don't like too much fuss. Nobody does as they get older, but I still enjoy race riding and intend to keep on as long as that continues. Well, he still brings a lot to the game and he should keep on. Don't tell McCrick who thinks he shouldn't. And quite a buzz in the papers for this bit on the side, this mutton horse in the November handicap this afternoon. Bit special. This is uh, Henry Ricks, the Naps table leader in today. Bit on the side, looks set to take her revenge. That's Tony Stafford in the Telegraph. And this is a real task being set here. Ken Oliver in The Guardian, Dunlop to make it November the 4th, a day behind. Goes for Beecham Hero. Well, with nine stone ten in this ground, that horse faces a tremendous task trying to win for the first time over the trip. And we will see how the market goes to tell you whether Beecham Hero has any chance of winning the November handicap. But if you followed trainers, you definitely have John Dunlop on your shortlist, of course, for the November handicap. He's done really well in it, uh, really, since he began training. So. Will Beecham Hero be one of your selections? Because that particular race, the 2.30, the November Handicap, is one that you have to be involved in for today's champion tipster. How did our contestants fare last week? Well, here's the result. <coughs> the leading standings were the winner, Mr Robert Ward, with 85 points from Orpington in Kent, an equal second, John Worthington with 84, Jim Kennedy with 84, one from Lancashire, one from the other side of the Pennines in West Yorkshire. 
And of course, we had our star prize for October, which went to Michael Grogan from Trinity Road, Darlington, County Durham, who got a tremendous 142 points on the 15th of October. Obviously, didn't follow any of our tips on the morning line that day. And this, to see just what he has won, you talk to British Midland Holiday Prize and British Midland Holiday Weekend for two, plus a year's membership for two at you talk to races. Good choice of destinations, Amsterdam, Brussels, Dublin, Frankfurt, Nice, Parma, Paris, and you get hotel, bed and breakfast for two nights and a bottle of champagne on arrival just to celebrate your success. That, of course, will also be awarded in November. So get your tips working out now. Work out your tips now. Helps if you string a sentence together in the right order, doesn't it? Never mind your tips. And the prospect of uh, winning £500 or the chance of going to one of those exotic resorts, if that's um, absolutely grabs your attention and you'll want to have a go at today's champion tips to competition and here's how you do it you have to make three selections per race and those are in the uh, 125 to 305 races and the points scored according to starting price the highest aggregate total wins the 500 pounds and to do that you register your selections on 0891991148 and the scoring system is thus if if uh, the old horse wins at less than two to one, you get one point. From uh, two to one to eleven to four, two points. Three to one to seven to one, two, <laughs> three points. Very easy, this, as you can understand. Four to one to nine to two, four points. It's actually quite simple. Oh eight nine one double nine double one four eight. Well, you know, John and Leslie have sort of more or less helped to confuse the competition as much as possible. But I'm sure we've been doing it for years. I'm sure you've got an idea. Good, good luck with understanding it, never mind entering it. And good luck with this as we go into a break, because today's turf trivia comes from Tom Duncan from Methyl in Fife. And he asks, before John Frankham says something rude, we'll go into the break, what became legal on May the 1st, 1961? The answer, in a moment. Which paper takes you closer to the top names in racing? What paper has unique facts and figures for all the day's meetings? Who gives you the full rundown on past performances for every horse? Morning, your Racing Post. It's all in here for the Breeders' Cup. The Racing Post is designed for you. It's got all you need for racing today. And they're under orders. And it's the Racing Post. Everyone's reading it. Are you? Ring your insurance company. Ask them how they'll help you out in a crash. Then ring AA Insurance. It's all right, Flower. We're just going to fetch Daddy. He's missed his train. Ford, the people who were first to make anti-lock brakes standard on a car, and the first to build a driver's airbag into every car they make, have done it again. All new Ford cars now come with a mobile phone. Hello? Hi, it's me. It's OK. Oh. Managed to get a lift. Oh, that's with free connection and cell net line rental of less than £10 a month, you can stay in touch however far you go. Fords with phones, because you never know. HMV presents Motown. The ultimate hits collection. Thirty years of musical history. Forty-six timeless tracks on one definitive double album. Motown, the ultimate hits collection at HMV. No HMV, no music. Orange believe that a monthly charge should at least buy you the right to talk. And in the future, maybe everyone will think that way. That's why Orange offer you 60 minutes of airtime to fixed line phones included in your £25 monthly charge. That's a little longer than it takes to fly from London to Edinburgh. The future's bright. The future's orange. Classic rock. The works of Tim Rice and Andrew Lloyd Webber out now. Everyone needs 100.
100% pure love. 40 classic love songs to send shivers down your spine. 100% Pure Love is simply a wonderful collection of the most powerful ballads ever recorded. The greatest songs, the greatest artists, the greatest love album ever. 100% Pure Love. Well, did you get it? What became legal on 1st of May 1961? The opening of betting shops. Some say the biggest innovation that ever happened in racing and the best. Some disagree. But we won't mull over that point. We'll move on with uh, another race here at Doncaster, the 125, which is a really competitive condition sprint, the Remembrance Day Stakes. Those are the best prices. If you shop around, 3 to 1 Branson Abbey, 6 to 1 Hard to Figure, 8 Caranita, 9 to 1 Bunty Boo, uh, and double blue, and it's 10 to 1, um, Beggar and Thief, and 12 to 1 upwards, the remainder. Well, a couple of these clashed uh, a fortnight ago in the Racing Post Stakes, where Beggar and Thief uh, and Karanita finished second and fourth to Matasha. Yep, Beggar and Thief just having the lead taken away from him here by the eventual winner, Matasha, in the Hamden Armac Tomb Colours. Karanita, who's obviously slightly more fancied in the betting today than Beggar and Thief, coming with a good late run but they actually both just sort of stay on. They make no impression on the winner. And obviously Beggarman Thief here plugs on the better. Frankie certainly gets after him, but he has no more. That was seven furlongs. Of course, there's a furlong less today. Uh, whether it will help or not, I'm not so sure. Yeah, I think she got a fair... I think, sorry, she, I think Leslie's got a fair point there, John. Um, back at six, are they likely to improve for that? Well, what we've been saying all morning is the fact that you want to get every yard of this six furlongs. There's only a couple of horses of one over seven. This hard to figure is actually one over seven. He goes in the soft ground, loves, you know, went in bottomless ground at Lingfield the other day. Mm. Um, didn't exactly, as Leslie said, didn't exactly think, oh, well, you know, they're really staying on, or you know, even though it was seven, you know, quickened up or, you know, no. must go out and back this next time. Right. Whereas... Um, Branston Abbey and Double Blue, both of those really sort of hit you in the face and said, well, hang on, this filly's just coming back to herself. Um, and Double Blue, who she beat, has come on and absolutely hosed up at Nottingham. Um, I mean, that, yeah, but he was a long odds on there, John. He was, no, he was long odds on. But he's, a, I mean, he's, he's not an old horse, but he's had plenty of racing. And, um, he's a good yardstick, isn't he? He's a good, he's a good yardstick, and I think it would have done him the world of good. He's won with his ears pricked, and he went at Nottingham, you know, pull up round that bend. He was still running away going round there. He really enjoyed himself. And sounds she'd given him a good hide in the time before, so, you know, I think she's going to take a bit of beating Branston. I was just going to say, it sounds as though you, you had some of the 7-1 to one on that day, the way you were talking <laughs> about that race. No, not at all. It's quite nice when you see these old horses going around and sprinting. They're off the bridle the whole time, and then you suddenly see them enjoying themselves, you know, having a chance to sort of like have a bit of a blow. Mm. You, know, you know, he's a bit of an old character. It's certainly Branson Abbey's time of year, isn't it? I mean, she, every, this, this time every year, she just sort of clocks up a few wins. Mm. Um, I, I'm, we disagreed on the charity bet front here, and uh, I would, I'm a hard to figure person, I must say. I think he's better He's got a six pound in, pull, hasn't yeah, he? Yeah, he's better yeah. in at the weights, and I think that, that win on the heavy at Lingfield as well. Uh, and he's, uh, he's just such a lovely old campaigner. So it's hard to figure for you? Yeah. Uh, I'm a Branston Abbey. Branston yeah. Abbey for you, Branston Abbey for me. Alistair, a classic example this mm -hmm. week, I thought, of uh, an old journalistic saying, never let the facts spoil a good story, coming back to roost. Well, yes, it was. But, I mean, facts, of course, are not things that politicians deal in any more than they do journalists. So here on the front page of the Times today, we have Heseltine was ready to go if Post Bill fell. Talk about the privatisation. Well, the Post Bill did fall. Heseltine is still here. You'd rather have a guarantee from one of the big three, I think, than you would from a politician. And a bit of a worrying story here. Poppy appealing crisis is more is spent than received. We're a week off Armistice Day. And uh, the British Legion have got a shortfall in funds, despite generous giving to, to those who, you know, from those who buy poppies. And there are still a great number of dependents around from various conflicts in, over the last few years. Laurie McNenemy, uh, who was at this launch lunch yesterday, was saying that there are millions of people who will be queuing in the next few weeks to buy the national lottery tickets. Now is a good time to practice putting your hands in your pocket. That's a good cause, the poppy appeal. Very disturbing here on the front page of The Independent. Air traffic control is next on the sell-off list. 
privatisation of air traffic control has been put back on the agenda by the Cabinet as part of a plan to rebut criticism that the government's run out of ideas. Well, there's, I mean, there's no idea that the government's out of ideas, just they haven't got any good ones. And if these, bar <laughs> if these barn pots put air traffic control away, let's hope it doesn't go to Group 4, which was their last triumph. <laughs> And here on the front of the Telegraph, Stormy Norm routes lager louts. This bloke who God gave ham bones to for forearms. He was on his tube at 8 o'clock in the morning yesterday in London, and a couple of drunks got on, and one of them lit a cigarette. This chap is a rugby player of some note, 6 foot 9 and 19 stone. One of the passengers said, When he stood up, it was almost comic. His head touched the roof of the carriage, and I think the louts could not believe it. He just thumped the ringleader twice. Not hard enough to do any damage, but enough to send him falling back into the seat. He put out the cigarette. They got off at the next stop and everyone clapped and cheered. Well, well done, Storm in Norm. And here an exclusive for the morning line. This is the new brain that is going to be installed in the race planning department <laughs> or possibly given to David Aldry if he wants to improve on his competitive racing. That might be unfair to the world's largest potato, I don't know. Uh, and here from the Breeders' Cup, the big action tonight. Locksong is the big name on everyone's lips today. Steve Cawthon in the Racing Post. And he just tells you how she is up against it. She says she has a lot to overcome. She won't be able to dictate. She's racing on dirt for the first time, round a turn, which is unfamiliar for her, and over six furlongs, which is seemingly beyond her optimum distance. Well, I think Corton has listed the problems Locksong faces. You pay your money, you take your choice. Here, Julian Muscat takes his choice at Barathea and Ezu to fly the British flag. Those two alone would double our, double our Breeders' Cup wins over the last 11 years. John Garns in the Express, you'll get no hype in this column, and he hopes that Stout's eccentric Ezood will prove the pick of our Raiders. And here, Rob, uh, Richard Edmondson, in very good form in The Independent, talking to Pat Day, the leading American jockey, who has found God. He's found a few million quid along the way, as must be said. And he's talking about his past life. He says, now I praise the Lord that I've been delivered from the bondage of drugs and alcohol. That must be nice for him. And he's talking about his rides, must be talking about his rides in the Breeders' Cup. He says, I just pray that I'll be able to conduct myself in a way, a form and a fashion that will be pleasing in God's eyes and that will contribute to the cause of Christ. I wonder if any of the winning jockeys in the November handicap come up with a view like that. Uh, but to put the perspective, you know, to put the Breeders' Cup into perspective, good piece by Alan Del Monte and the life, bookies unlikely to lay off, saying that they're not going to be playing in the tote pools over there to affect the SP. Paul Austin, Labrick spokesman, revealed that the liability on any, any single horse is not expected to be large enough, while Malcolm Palmer of Corals reported light betting. The simple fact is that despite all those great horses over there, they'll do more business on the novice chase at Newcastle. And talking about doing business, here an advert in lots of the papers today, 7 to 1 the field. This is um, William Hills in the Tote Credit November Handicap. Well, by all means, take it, but if you shop around, you can get 8 to 1 everything. <laughs> Well, Alsa mentioned a novice chase at uh, Newcastle. We're not going to look at a novice chase now, but we're going to look at a novice inner chase, the uh, Plymouth Gin Holden Gold Cup Challenge Chase. Absalom's Lady was the novice in question. She was taking on Travado, a wonder man, deep sensation, to name but uh, three. That was last Wednesday. Here's John Franken. Well, this was a tremendous comeback for Travado, and we pick it up as he's jumping to second last, but his jump at the second fence in the straight had to be seen to be leaving must have been covered something like 30 feet and just look at Absalom's lady the gray just about to jump now this was her first run over fences she's run a tremendous race for uh, Paul Holly and David Ellsworth never ever going to get to this horse Travado's had a lovely first run of the season and uh, lots to look forward to for uh, Nicky Henderson his trainer Johnny, that was um, actually, just for race goers, a lot of people, Devon's a long way away for a lot of people. It's a fantastic track. Just to, what sort of a test is it for the horses? Well, it's, it deserves to have a good race like that. It's a big galloping track. They run down um, a reasonable hill in the far side, up the dip, and from then on it's a steady pull all the way. Not, nothing like Toaster or something, and certainly not as steep as Ascot, but it's a steady climb right the way up for the last, certainly, mile and a quarter. It's a very fair course. The going's invariably good from this time of year on, and uh, you know it's great to see them getting good horses like that down there. I mean, amazing performance that, and Jamie Osborne has never seen him ride better. Mm. So lots to look forward to. Uh, Deep Sensation, interestingly, uh, uh, ran in that run as though the race was just needed. He, of course, is usually partnered by Declan Murphy, who's still out of action uh, from that horrific fall he sustained at Haydock uh, 
uh, back at uh, Springbank holiday time, well, Declan's made the most fantastic recovery. We saw him on Channel 4 uh, last weekend, and uh, he was in action in London earlier this week, where he received the Daily Star SIS Racing Personality of the Year Award. And Jenny Pittman, who did the honours there, that was a really poignant moment. Lovely to see. Long may Declan continue to thrive. Well, I suppose Declan's recovery is uh, one of the highlights uh, of what's been, a, as ever, a tremendous uh, year in racing. What will 1994 be remembered for? That, Flaky Dove maybe over jumps, I suppose on the flat scene, Balanchine, Sheen, possibly King's Theatre, maybe Locks on again. But surely when you look back, 1994 will be remembered by most people as the year of Frankie de Tori, a new champion, a great champion, and a tremendous personality, vibrant, enthusiastic, and here, with the help of Sister Sledge, Mark Jackson has taken a look at just how Frankie's season has swung. lovely to see again. He's great for racing. Uh, we're really lucky to have him and good work there by Mark Jackson. That takes an awful lot of putting together something like that. Alistair, more news I gather. Yes, there's quite a move developing in the November handicap on this Cumbrian Rhapsody of Peter Easterby's. Labrooks were long at 25, so they've taken good money in large amounts from the so-called professionals and Hills are laying the 20 to 1 as well, so there's some shrewd money about for that. Um, Fête Galante in the 3-5, our two-miler, that's been back to 8-1 to one with Labrooks, and there's going to be a real head-to-head -head develop in that race, because there's money for Shujan, the Akehurst tool, that's been taken 11-2 to two with Hills. Branston Abbey, Hills were longest 11-4 to four in our sprint, that's going. All the prices guarantee, but you can certainly see, after the guarantees have gone, that Cumbrian Rhapsody in particular will shorten with both the big firms, and needless to say, they are laying the sentimental money locks on, and I think happy to do it. 
So that's the update. What's the latest news from our team? It's charity bet time, please. Hard to figure. Hard to figure. And I'm going for Jenny's horse in the novice chase down at Chepstow, Smith's man. Why is that? Well, because her horses are just in really good form. He jumped smashing. What, sorry, what's his name? Run, run Smith's lawn. Smith, right. Um, yeah. he's, he, he ran once. Smith's he's, band. Smith's man. It's band, rather. He's, he ran once, won, won once, jumped out of his skin. Right. Fake your lawn to now, three, five. Oh, eight. you said people were backing that. You didn't say shrewd professional. No, no, I didn't. Absolutely not. Well, you are a shrewd professional. Why didn't so you they say? Tell me. Well, I haven't backed it yet. <laughs> <laughs> what if they don't hold the price for you? Oh, they will. Yeah, I think I think they I think they will be too. happy. Let's, to. let's just double check on those. Leslie's going for hard to figure in the 125 at Dogster. Frank's going for Smith's Band. Just double check that. Smith's Band in the two o'clock at Chepstow. Alice has gone for number ten Fet Gallant in the 305 at Doncaster. Don't dare reduce it till he's been on the blower. And I'm going for Strong Deal in the 140 at Newcastle. So time now for the picture puzzle. If you think you know the name of the horse that that Paul, Hard ca Paul Hartman cartoon depicts and it's running at one of today's meetings, something to heat you up, sir? Well, the number to ring is 0891991144. That's the Paul Hartman cartoon depicting a runner at one of today's meetings. Well, then, have a go at that, then. Well, thank you for joining us. We look forward to you being with us again this afternoon. Thanks to John, Alistair and Leslie. We're back again at 1.15. Channel 4.